In this video, we're going to talk about how to communicate with your partner if your partner has a dismissive avoidant attachment style. And if you are in that situation, you know that communication can be very difficult. And you have probably learned the standard relationship advice, the standard advice to use I feel statements to avoid criticism and blame, and you find that it's not working. So I'm going to explain what the standard advice is, why it doesn't work, and what you can do instead. And before we get into that, my name is Daniel Robertson. I am an attorney turned relationship coach. I'm the host of the Dealing with an Avoidant Partner private Facebook group. I'm really proud of this supportive community. We've got well over 500 members right now. Everybody is very supportive and very kind and respectful. And I'm really proud of what this community has done, which of course is about how great you all have been as the members. And this question is coming from questions in that group. So we're going to get into that. I'm also the host of the Courageous Love Community. Now this is a pr paid private group coaching community. And what we're doing in that community is we are finding genuine love within ourselves so that we can achieve lasting happiness. And what this means is that we stop chasing emotionally unavailable partners. It means that we become securely attached so that we feel secure when we are in relationship and when we are out of relationship. So if you're interested in that, you can contact me on Facebook or really any social media platform. I'm on facebook.com slash Daniel William Robertson, or you can find me on Instagram or elsewhere as at Daniel Robertson online. So I look forward to connecting with you and I'm going to jump right in to the advice for you. So I want to first mention that when we're dealing with dismissive avoidant attachment styles, there is a spectrum here. So if you've got somebody who I'll call the doing the work dismissive avoidant, maybe they are on the lower end of the spectrum, they're putting in the work, they're going to therapy, they want to become a better partner, they want to show you that they love and care about you, so they're showing up, they're learning their communication skills, then some of the standard relationship advice to use your I feel statements to, and these kinds of things could, could possibly work with them. Every individual is unique. Every relationship is unique. So if it's working for you, great. Do what's working for you. If you're dealing with somebody who is more moderate to extreme on the scale of dismissive avoidance, um, then I don't think, in, in my experience, I'll say, in my experience in my own life and dealing with my clients and their partners, Standard advice of I feel statements, avoid criticism and blame, isn't enough. You're, you'll find that it's not working, and so we'll talk about why. So if we want to communicate effectively, right, when does this matter? This matters when we need to have a difficult conversation, when we need to talk about issues in the relationship, when we need to talk about um, whether we are feeling happy and supported in the relationship, whether our needs are getting met in the relationship, whether we feel upset about something. These are the kinds of situations that are bringing up the difficulty where these conversations need to happen. So when we're going down that road, where do we even start? First, I think the best place to start is to empathize with ourselves, because what, what are we doing? And also to take a look at our own things that we're bringing to the table, the issues that we're bringing to the table. So so if we're in a relationship with somebody who's dismissive avoidant, there's a chance that we're more on the anxious to anxious uh, or fearful avoidant um, side of the attachment style spectrum. And if that's the case, then we want to check ourselves. Are we being too needy? Are we, are we really not taking care of our own needs? And are we um, expecting too much for them, putting them on a pedestal, expecting them to fill some kind of void or to, to give us that validation that we need to know that we're okay and we're enough? And if we are doing that, if we're being a little too needy or too clingy, then we want to take a look at that and, and, and check ourselves and really regulate ourselves emotionally so that we come from a good place from the start. That being said, once we've looked at ourselves, really empathize with yourself because I know that what you want is a healthy interdependent relationship. That's why you're putting the time in to invest into learning how to communicate better, how to show up better, how to regulate yourself emotionally so that you can show up better as a partner. Th these things all show that you care and really 
I know that what you want is you want to love and care about your partner and to help meet their needs. And you want the same thing back for yourself. All you're asking is for, for love back, which would be a normal, natural thing to happen in a healthy, interdependent relationship where you give and receive love freely. It's not transactional. It's an organic and natural flow. And that's really where your heart is. And that's really what you want. So I want to empathize with you. Start with with you knowing that you're coming from a good place and that you have taken an honest look at yourself to, to figure out, do I need to regulate myself? Are these needs that I need to really think think about how I can meet my own needs? And also think about whether, you know, you're happy in the relationship and, and the whole picture here. But you're here because you love somebody who's got uh, a dismissive avoidant attachment style you want to love them and you want to see if there's a way to make the relationship work so that they they can love you back as well we don't want a one-sided situation coming out of this so you're coming from a good place in your heart taking an honest look at yourself and really putting in work on your side now let's take a look at their side the next place to always start in my opinion uh, when we're getting into communication is to empathize with them so if we are, if we find ourselves, we're bringing up conversations about our feelings and our needs, and we're being met with being dismissed, being invalidated. So we say, hey, you know, I had this problem with Bob at work today, and they meet you with, well, you know, Bob's a pretty good guy, so he probably didn't mean to hurt your feelings. So kind of invalidating or dismissing what you were saying. They probably didn't intend it that way, but if that's what's happening, then it makes sense that you would feel kind of invalidated. And and why are they responding that way to you bringing them your feelings? Well, remember what the dismissive avoidant has learned from their childhood, from their earlier experiences about feelings. The way that they learned to deal with feelings and to cope with feelings that are uncomfortable or that they don't like is to push them down. They've learned that feelings aren't very important. It doesn't really matter how you feel. You still have to show up. You still have to do your work. You still have to do take care of your responsibilities. Your feelings don't really matter that much. So they have learned to push feelings down. And when you bring them your feelings, they've might be feeling uncomfortable or they might be feeling confused as to why you're even bringing your feelings to them. So that's what how they feel about feelings. How do they feel about needs in a relationship? Well, what did they learn? They learned that needs that I'm responsible for my needs, you're responsible for your needs. That's what they learned as children because their caregivers didn't really uh, allow them to feel like their needs were important and that their needs mattered and were validated. So they learned, I take care of my needs, you take care of your needs, that's the way it is. So if you bring them your needs, then they might, they might first they might get kind of withdrawn, they might kind of pull back from that because you're bringing your needs and they're thinking, well, maybe they actually it could actually be triggering some kind of core fear that they have that they're not good enough that they're defective somehow that they're not going to be able to meet your needs and they might kind of withdraw from feeling that fear they don't really want to want to face it because it's too uncomfortable there's too much fear there so that could be one way that they respond I, and the other way that you might get a response is they might kind of come back at you with some anger that you're bringing that you're bringing your needs. And why are they coming with anger? Because in their mind, they're responsible for their own needs and you're responsible for your own needs. So why would you bring your, your needs to them? They're kind of angry at you for putting that on them. And they might feel like it's unfair. Well, I'm responsible for my needs. How unfair of you to bring your needs to me as well. And again, this is what they learned as, as children, potentially, if they've got a dismissive avoidant attachment style, that they learned that they had to take care of their own needs. What they're missing is that, yes, there's actually some truth there. We are all responsible for our own needs. But when we enter into a relationship, part of what entering into a relationship means when it's a healthy interdependent relationship is that I care about your needs. You care about my needs. I want to help make sure that your needs are met. I want to help make sure that you feel cared for, that you feel happy. 
and you should want the same thing for me. That is the natural thing that happens naturally and organically in a healthy interdependent relationship. And that's the aspect that the dismissive avoidant is missing because they didn't have that experience themselves of somebody else caring about their needs, like their needs actually mattered and that somebody else actually cared about making sure that their needs were met and that they were happy. So that's where it's coming from. And we really wanna empathize with that. We also want to empathize with the with the fact that they've been taught that auto, that independence and autonomy are very important values. So they're they're coming from that perspective. And if you do anything that seems like you're trying to control them, which you're probably not, maybe, maybe you are, maybe you're not. But if you're if you're trying to control them, or they feel like you're trying to control them, that's feeling to them like you're violating a, a boundary of theirs that you're violating a value of theirs because they value independence and autonomy and they might respond negatively to that, understandably, because they were taught to value independence and the idea of somebody controlling us is is potentially very something to be afraid of, right? So they don't want to be vulnerable in that situation of allowing somebody to control us or even worse, to engulf us or smother us, right? So. The last thing to keep in, in, in mind when we are empathizing with, with their perspective is that they are very sensitive, probably very sensitive to shame. So anything that we do that feels like criticism or blame is going to probably trigger a sense of shame in them. And they need a lot of reassurance that there's nothing wrong with them, that there's nothing bad, that they didn't they're not they're not broken they're not defective they're not um, they're not bad in any way and we might need to reassure them that way because of that shame that they haven't really learned how to deal with they might not even be aware that they're feeling shame and the the discomfort of the shame might cause them to say well I'm not I'm it's not my problem I didn't do something wrong it was actually you who did something wrong that's probably a, a response to be having their shame triggered. So we want to be sensitive to all these things. And why would they feel shame? Probably because the children, their caregivers, told them that they should feel shame, that they should feel bad when they didn't do something correctly, right? So we empathize with where they're coming from. All right, that's, I think, the, the most important place to start when we're coming to communication with somebody and now we get into more of actually how do we structure the communication with them to the first the first thing that i think is really important is to be short concise and clear why because if we're talking about an issue of like a relationship issue then they are likely to well i shouldn't say likely but there's a there's a high potential that they could feel overwhelmed by 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 the complaints or by um, the emotions that are involved they could feel overwhelming so we want to keep things short concise and clear and a lot of dismissive avoidance will say that they don't really pick up on hints very well that if, if you if you're just saying something like like oh you know i really like i i really like a, words of affirmation is my love language i really like words of affirmation that might they might not pick up the fact that you want them to give them to give you words of affirmation from that the hint isn't isn't making sense they need you to be sh clear and concise and direct about what it is that you're saying what it is that you're wanting they might not pick it up because they're not attuned to your needs their their mode of operation is they they take care of themselves and you take care of yourself. So they're not attuned to your needs the same way. Somebody certainly who's anxious or, or fearful avoidant um, is, is, has learned to cope by being attuned to other people's needs. And so we become highly attuned and even sometimes hypervigilant. But they're not attuned to your needs. They're not, they're not listening. Their antenna isn't up to pick up what your needs and your hints are. So you need to be clear and direct about what it is that you're saying and what it is that you want so that would be 
uh, one, one piece of it. And the second piece is to be positive. In my experience, again, I don't want to paint people with a broad brush. Every individual is unique. In my personal experience, people with a dismissive avoidant attachment style are also prone to negativity. I think all humans are, we're kind of prone to negativity, but if you've got a dismissive avoidant attachment style, they're prone to a little bit more negativity. So if as much as possible, if we can put a positive spin on our language, if we can put a positive spin. So instead of saying, hey, I noticed you didn't take out the trash. I noticed you left the dishes on the counter instead of putting them in the dishwasher. I noticed you didn't take care of the lawn or you didn't give me a kiss when I came, when, when I came home from work. You didn't hug me, whatever. Instead of focusing on the negative, how can we spin that around? We can make it positive. We can say, hey, you know, I really love it when you give me uh, a hug and a kiss when I get home from work. I, I, I love it when you... Um, just give me little words, words to let me know, like how you're feeling about me. So you might hear phrases like, oh, I'm really happy with you. I, um, I'm, I'm really happy that we're together. Or you might hear, you're not going to get right a love poem probably, or any gushing romantic, um, you know, expressions of, of romantic love, but you'll hear things like, um, I re- I really, I really feel happy together, this kind of thing. So you can let them know when you say things like you really feel happy together or that you love me, that really feels like that really feels um, really good to me. And I I just love it when you do that, you know, put this positive spin. When I when I cook dinner and you uh, clean the kitchen afterwards and make sure all the dishes get into the dishwasher, I just love that so much. You do such a great job cleaning the kitchen. I just love it. So if we can put a positive spin on things, that's going to help as well. Um, Advice like remove all criticism is very important. Like we talked about, if somebody's dismissive avoidant, um, they're going to be sensitive to shame. So we do need to remove all criticism. They're going to be sensitive to this idea that you are criticizing them or blaming them. In fact, if, if you're with somebody who's dismissive avoidant, you probably know that they can hear criticism where there is none. Where if you look at the words on the page, there is literally no criticism there. Like we can actually define this. So it's very important to remove criticism, to remove blame. And I'll get into a little bit more of how to do this. I think it's also helpful to avoid emotional displays because... Um, when we talk about the standard advice of I feel statements, I feel sad. If you say I feel sad, um, the dismissive avoidant could hear you made me feel sad and that could trigger their fear that they're not good enough, their fear that they're defective and then their shame and send them into a defensive spiral or even worse into an aggressive spiral where they, they blame you because they think that you're blaming them. Remember, their their way of dealing with emotions is to push them down. So if you bring them your emotions, they might not know what to do with it. So avoid big emotional displays. We're going to kind of downplay our emotions. Um, they're going to be extra sensitive to shame. So there's some techniques that I like to use to deal with shame. One thing going into a conversation is before launching into this conversation, we can say, hey, you know how... You know, if I were to, if I were to make a mistake, that wouldn't make me a bad person, right? Or, or if I ever left you feeling like you're unhappy in the relationship, would you say that that makes me a bad person? And they're going to say no, because intellectually they know, no, no, that doesn't make you a bad person because there are always times in a relationship where sometimes we don't meet each other's needs or sometimes we're unhappy, right? So they're intellectually going to know, no. And you can ask them that before getting into the conversation so they know, okay, oh, yeah, just because somebody has a complaint doesn't mean that I'm a bad person so that we can help to prime them so that they don't trigger their shame. Another technique that I like to use is a third party technique. So I'll just bring up a conversation. I'll say, hey, you know, Bob and Kathy at work, Um, you know, Bob was telling me that this issue came up in their relationship and he was telling me this about it. And I was like, Bob, um, you know that just because you weren't meeting Kathy's needs doesn't mean that you're a bad person. 
you're still a good husband. You're trying your best. What more can anybody ask, right? So we use a third party technique to talk about the concepts and you could use this co this concept for the actual substance of the complaint. And you say, I actually realized when Bob and Kathy were, were, when Bob was telling me about his conversation with Kathy, then I realized that actually that's a relationship uh, or an issue in our relationship too. I realized that came up in our relationship. And just like it wasn't, you know, I mean, obviously I'm kind of going into more detail than you would in the actual conversation probably. But the same thing happened with them. I realized with us, I realized it doesn't make, it doesn't mean that you did anything wrong. It just means this is something we need to talk about, right? So really doing a lot to make it easier for somebody to handle, uh, to handle the conversation without feeling like they're being attacked. I got to say, I, in my own experience with dismissive avoidance, you have to do a lot of work. I mean, this is kind of, this is a lot more work than you'd have to do with a healthy, securely attached person to have a conversation with them. If somebody, yeah, I mean, I could go into it, but you get what I'm saying. You get what I'm saying that this, you're going to have to do more work to have this conversation than you would have to do with a healthy, securely attached person. Um, and it's up to you, you know, I mean, that's the, that's, it's your relationship. So you decide how much work that you're willing to put in and what the, you know, what the give and take is in the relationship there. Um, so be patient. Yes. All right. So how can we, how can we kind of put this together and structure something? Well, let me explain. I'll just, I'll just, I'll give the example of nonviolent communication. If you studied, if you studied, if you've learned, I feel statements from your therapist or, I mean, one of the best forms of I feel statements that's really good for removing criticism and blame is called nonviolent communication developed by Dr. Marshall Rosenberg. And a lot of people in, in these communities, uh, uh, the communities like, like our group have learned nonviolent communication because it's so good at removing criticism and blame and because your heart is in such a good place of wanting to love this person and finding it so difficult to communicate so you're willing to put in so much work to figure out how can I communicate with this person because they are not making it easy. So you've tried to learn nonviolent communication, you've done a great job and yet it's still not working. So, so what is nonviolent communication? How do you structure your I feel statements this way? And how can we shift things to work for for our relationship with a dismissive avoidant um, partner. First, the, here's, here's the fundamental way that nonviolent communication works. The, the sentence structure is like this. Uh, the basic, when we're first learning, is when I feel and I put in my observation, not my evaluations or my judgments or my analyses or any blame, nothing that says that somebody's wrong, just observations. So when you said the words, and I quote, this is just an observation. I'm not, I'm not adding any embellishments. I'm not adding my evaluations about it. I'm just saying you said the words. When you walked past the trash can, observation. It, it's, I saw it with my eyes. I saw you walk past the It's not a debatable fact, right? It's, it's a fact. And it's not, it's not, hey, when you didn't pick up your socks, that makes you a slob, okay? You are a slob or that makes you a slob. That's my evaluation, that's my analysis, right? When, when you dismissed me, when I had a problem with Bob at work and you said Bob was actually right, you were dismissing me. You were dismissing me as an evaluation. So we're taking out the, you know, we're, we're, we're taking out the evaluation, we're just focusing on the observation. When you did this, when you said these exact words, right? So fo focusing on the observation as a way to remove any criticism and blame, great start, great start. So in nonviolent communication, we say, when you did this observa observable behavior, and in nonviolent communication, we say, when you did this observable behavior, I felt, and we say a feeling, because we recognize our feelings come from our needs. Our feelings are not because of what somebody else did. Our feelings are because we have needs. So when you did, when when you said this, I felt, I felt hurt. I felt sad. I felt, um, you know, angry. I felt lonely. Whatever it was, because I have a need for 
love. I have a need for connection. I have a need for affection. I have a need for respect, right? I have a need for physical touch. These are needs, right? I have a need for assurances. I have a need for peace. I have a need for harmony, right? So these, these are all our needs. So when you did this observable behavior, I felt fill in the, the feeling. And because I have a need for love or respect or connection or whatever it is, or intimacy. And then in nonviolent communication, we say, will you please? And then we make a specific, positive, actionable, doable request. That's standard relationship advice. When, when somebody speaks to me in nonviolent communication, oh my gosh, my heart melts. I feel connected heart to heart. I'm like, this person is speaking my language. They're telling me how they feel. They're telling me what they need. And I just get to express my generosity. They get to express their generosity and openness and vulnerability with me. And we connect. And I love it. But why doesn't it necessarily work with the dismissive avoidant? Didn't we do all this work just now to take out all the criticism and blame and it's still not working? Yes, it's still not working with a dismissive avoidant partner. Why? Okay, so the observation part is great because we just took out, we just focused on our observation and we took out the any evaluation or analysis. We took out anything that implies that they are wrong. There's nothing in there that says that you're wrong. When you walked past the trash can, there's nothing in there that says that they were wrong. We're just pointing out an observation, right? We need to be able to state facts in a relationship, don't we? How can you communicate if we can't meet this basic ability to state facts? So then we get to the phrase in nonviolent communication where we would say, I feel a feeling. All right, here's where we're already going off track. Because normally when in a normal, healthy, interdependent relationship, when we say that we have a feeling, other people relate to our feelings and other people want us to feel happy in a normal, healthy, interdependent relationship. When we're dealing with the dismissive avoidant, if they hear your feelings, especially if it's a feeling that's seen as a negative feeling, they might feel criticized. They might not know what to do with your feelings. They've been taught to push feelings down, not to express them. So what do you have to do with your feelings? downplay them. You have to downplay your feelings. Say, you know, I felt I felt a little bummed. Instead of saying, I felt really sad. I felt devastated. Oh my gosh, don't tell a dismissive avoidant that you felt devastated or you felt so, so sad. Tell them, I felt a little bit sad. Uh, you know, I felt a little bit lonely or nothing or just leave out your feelings. Just leave out your feelings. Okay. So, hey, when you walked past the trash can, you know, I felt I felt a little bit kind of like bummed by that because you had said previously that you'd take out the trash. So we're downplaying the feelings. And then we get to the need. So I have this feeling I felt a little bit bummed. Normally, we would say, because I have a need for respect or I have a need to, you know, um, feel a sense of serenity in my home uh, or a sense of comfort in my home. Everybody's got a, a, a need to feel comfort, especially in our homes. And it, seeing the trash overflowing would disrupt that for, for a lot of people. And so if we bring a dismissive avoidant our needs, what's going to happen? They're, they might not understand why you're bringing them your needs like we already talked about so if we want to bring them our needs the way that i suggest going about bringing them your need is saying hey you know how it's really important for you to feel respected or you know how it's really important for you to feel like respected and if i and if 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 you if i did something that you felt disrespected you you would not like that right and you want me you want me to you know really care about your need for respect right and i want to care about your need for respect right and if you so so you understand how you would feel well just like you feel the need you have the need for respect i i have a need it might be a little bit different than your needs 
which is totally okay. We're all different people. One of my needs is to feel like, to feel comfortable, to have a level of serenity in my home, you know, in our home together. And and when you walk past the trash can, when we both know that, that we, we've both already talked about it, you've agreed that you'll be responsible to take out the trash. When you walk past the trash can, it was overflowing. Um, that disrupted, that kind of like left me feeling like, like I, my need for, like my need for, um, you know, serenity, comfort, peace in my home wasn't getting like, wasn't, wasn't, didn't matter. Like it wasn't cared for. I think it's really important that you might hear that and you might say that sounds a little bit critical. I think it's really important to, to be clear and direct with a dismissive avoidance, speaking to them in a language that they would understand. And I think they would understand this. And I think if you, if you took care ahead of time to say, to like care for their shame, like we talked about at the start to, to make them make it clear that you're not saying that they're a bad person, then being clear and direct in this way can work. And I think it's important to be clear and direct, to speak in a language that they can understand. Because again, if you just launch into your feelings, they're like, why are you bringing me your feelings? I'm responsible for my feel for my feelings and needs. And you're responsible for your feelings and needs. Don't bring me your feelings and needs. Right? So we need to spell out like, why does, why does it even matter that I'm talking about my needs? And you need to stand up for your needs and you need to be willing to advocate for your needs because that's how they would act, right? They're operating under a different set of rules than, than you're operating under. So you need to communicate in a way that they will understand. Finally, um, if you are getting to the request, okay, so here's the question. Do I make a request? In, non, in nonviolent communication, we really want to be respectful we, we want to create connection between people. And so we want to make requests because if we request something from somebody and we give them the freedom to say yes and no, that's really respectful. And that allows them to give out a generosity. And when we give out a generosity, we feel happy. If we are give out of compulsion because somebody demands us or forces us to, then we are left... Um, you know, like feeling disconnected in the relationship, like, oh, geez, I don't like that. They just forced me to do that. But these, we're not operating under the same set of rules when we're dealing with a dismissive avoidant partner. So, so here's the problem. If you make a request, then they could say no, and then you would never get your needs met because a dismissive avoidant does not naturally feel responsible for your needs. Remember their rule? I'm responsible for my needs. You're responsible for yours. They do not feel responsible for your needs. So they are not going to say, oh yeah, you're making a request and I'm free to say yes or no. Well then no, no, I'm not gonna take that on. They might say no, right? And then what do you do? What if it's, hey, could, could I have some physical affection? And you're in this relationship and they say no, there is nowhere else you can go to get physical affection. So you're left completely without your ability to get your needs met. So. To avoid that danger, I don't think it, it can be, I think it's more important to be direct with the dismissive avoidant and to say, look, this really matters to me. And part of being in a relationship with me means that you are going to help me take, you're going to care about my needs. And that's a boundary that you have, right? So being in a relationship with me means that you are going to care about my, my needs. And that is part of what it means to be in a relationship together. We have to be very direct and you have to advocate for yourself because otherwise your needs could probably go unmet, right? So instead of making a request, you need to be clear and direct about what it is that you want and say, part of being in a relationship with me means that you care about my needs. And when I come in the front door from work, I want you to give me a hug and a kiss. And they might not like that you say that, they might not like that you say that. Maybe you can come up with a nicer, easier way to say that. Again, we can be positive. We can say, I love it when you give me a, love and a, uh, a hug and a kiss, and it's really important to me. And if they're not willing to meet your needs, then here comes the ultimate question, because this always comes up in, dis in relationships with dismissive avoidance. Not always, but most of the time it comes up. If they're not willing to meet your needs, what do you do? You have a couple of options. You can either 
you can either decide to stay in the relationship and go without that need getting met or figure out if there is another way to get that need met that does not involve them, or you can decide to leave the relationship in various forms, right? There's probably other options. We can talk about other options, but it talks, it means you have to look at your own boundaries. If they won't meet your needs, what will you do? What options do you have and what will you do? And it needs to be very clear. So that's my take on communicating with a dismissive avoidant partner and how to go about it. So to kind of put it together, you would say, hey, when you walk past the trash can and we had an agreement that you take out the trash can, I want you to know it's really important to me that the trash goes out because, because that to me makes it so that I can have, like I can feel comfortable and happy in, in, in our house together. And I know you might not feel the same way, but your needs, you know, I, I care about your needs and I'm asking you to do this for us. Will you do that for us, right? Will you do that for our relationship? And be very clear that you expect it from them and why. So, and again, of course, caring for their shame, reminding them that they're not a bad person, trying and keeping it positive as much as possible. And why, again, do we have to keep it short and concise? Because if we try to make it, if we try to make it about the whole house, about, you know, you never pick up anything or you're just, you don't, you don't give enough. You don't take care of the housework enough in the house. If we try to make it something really big, and this means you're a slob, and this means you don't care about us, or this means that our marriage doesn't matter to you or whatever it is. If we make it really big, it's going to get really overwhelming. So short, concise, plain, English, uh, simple, easy to understand, clear. Make it as small as possible so that nobody gets overwhelmed, so that the conflict doesn't get out of hand, and we can just deal with one issue at a time. Again, it takes more patience to deal with the dismissive avoidant partner. Are you willing to put in the patience? That is a personal decision for you to make. Um, what else can I say about that? Should you compromise? That's a big question. Um, you can talk to me about, about that. Um, you know, compromise is necessary to maintain incompatible relationships. So you got to look at the compatibility in the relationship. Uh, but anyway, talk to me about, talk to me about compromise. What happens is if, you are doing all of the giving. You're, make, you're making all the compromises and they're making none. That becomes a very one-sided relationship. It becomes codependent and it means that you will end up suffering, feeling like your needs and feelings don't matter. You will end up getting resentful. And if you, and if you focus that energy on trying to change them, then they will become resentful at you. And maybe even with a good reason because you're trying to change them instead of instead of deciding what you will do in that situation. So again, I'm available to talk, to work through that kind of situation. I don't think that playing nice and always like always being the one to bend over backwards, that's not, that's not going to help. You could spend years and years with a dismissive avoidant, always being nice, hoping if I'm just nice to them, if I just meet their needs, then they will reciprocate. You can do that for years and years and the reciprocation will never come. It will never come being nice, bending over backwards, making sure that their needs get met while your needs go unmet. You can do that for years and years and they will never reciprocate. So playing nice does not work. You need to be direct. You need to advocate for yourself and you need to explain in words that they can understand why your needs matter and why they should be responsible for meeting some of your needs because you are in a relationship together and that's what being in a relationship means. Um, one other piece of advice that people get is, is setting appointments. Should you set an appointment? Timing does matter. So you don't want to go bring up a difficult conversation when they are busy with something else, when they are busy with work, when they are stressed out, when they've had a bad day. Uh, when they're in a bad mood, when they're exhausted from from a lot of work, okay, timing, or when they're hungry, right? Halt, hungry, or halts, hungry, angry, tired, lonely, stressed. Avoid those situations. M maybe lonely is okay in this context, but we don't want to we don't want to uh, start a difficult conversation when somebody's hungry, angry, tired, or stressed out. So. Um, what would that be? Hats? Yeah, hats. <laughs> so yes, your timing matters. 
And uh, do you want to set appointments, however, to have a difficult conversation? I would say no. You do not want to set an appointment to have a difficult conversation because what's that going to mean? That's going to mean there's a lot of anxiety building up before it gets to the difficult conversation. But you could check in. You could say, hey, I had something I want to talk with you about. Should be pretty, pretty short, simple to the point conversation. Is now a good time to talk about it? And they can say yes or no. They say no. Okay, I'll come and check back in later. And just check back in. And if they never say it's a, a good time, then you're going to have to make the conversation happen. And that's just the way it is. And they might not like it. But just understand that's the way it is. All right. Finally, I want you to be aware of a couple of things that do happen in conversations with dismissive avoidance, which is their projection. We've had this whole conversation, and a couple of things that will, will happen potentially is if you bring your feelings and needs up, even in a muted way, or if you say, hey, when you said some kind of comment to me that was hurtful, they might say that you're too sensitive Notice that this is a projection. You are probably not too sensitive, but they, we have to do all this work, all this work to communicate with the dismissive avoidant and make sure that there's no criticism, that there's no blame in there. We're doing all this work to make sure that there's no criticism or blame. And they're saying that we're too sensitive. Excuse me, this is a projection. This, mean, this is them being too sensitive. The same thing happens when they say, I'm just frustrated that I have to walk on eggshells around you. I have to walk on eggshells with you because I never know if I'm going to say things the right way. No, this is a projection. Look at what we have to do to avoid them getting defensive or avoid them attacking us. We have to do all this work to figure out how to communicate in the right way and make sure there's no blame or criticism. And... They're saying that we are, make, we are making them walk on eggshells. No, what they're saying, what's really happening, is they have not learned how to communicate properly in a way that cares about other people's feelings because what we say matters and how we say it matters. And they have not learned to, to deal with the how we say it. So in a, a lot of relationships, not all dismissive avoidance, definitely not all because I've talked with different clients who said it's not true for them and their partners. But a lot of dismissive avoidance will have a very critical way of communicating. And instead of saying, for example, instead of saying, I feel lonely, they will say, you are selfish. Or in instead of saying, I'm feeling overwhelmed by your feelings and needs, they will say, you are way too needy and clingy. Right, So they have a very critical way of communicating often, not all the time, but often. And that is not you making them walk on eggshells. That is you asking them for respectful communication. And it is not making them walk on eggshells. They are making you walk on eggshells by going through all this work, listening to this whole video to figure out how to communicate with them there, you are not making them walk on eggshells. But if you are, okay, there's always, there's always every relationship is unique. If you are making them walk on eggshells, because what that means is you're responding with a lot of emotional reactivity. This could be a man or a woman. It's not a gender thing. If you're responding with emotional reactivity or defensiveness or blame to, uh, to any kind of conversations that trigger you, then yes, you are making somebody walk on eggshells. So um, that is, you know, that, you know, that's something that you really, you know, n just need to be aware of that this projection happens and it can make you crazy. It's basically, we could call it crazy making, we could call it gaslighting. That's why I want you to be aware of this projection so that you do not get gaslit. You do not get, make, think that you're crazy. You're not. You're asking for basic, normal, human, healthy communication. There's a couple things. One thing that I left out is when, we're, when we are communicating our feelings, nonviolent communication is really good about this, is even taking the blame out of our feelings. So, so sometimes we'll say, oh, I'm feeling misunderstood. I'm feeling rejected. We can even take, take, take that out. If we say, I'm feeling rejected, I'm feeling misunderstood, I'm feeling attacked or whatever, 
then a dismissive avoidant could hear that and say, are you saying that I'm rejecting you? I'm not rejecting you. Are you saying I'm neglecting you? I'm not neglecting you. I'm not misunderstanding you. I'm not attacking you. They could hear that as criticism. So we remove those words, and when we focus on our feeling words, we focus on words that actually describe just the feeling in our body without the evaluation. So words like I feel sad, happy, angry, mad, lonely, um, disappointed, um, not unappreciated. Unappreciated would, would be uh, an evaluation. I'm, I'm saying that you're not appreciating me. No, so we're not saying that. We're saying, I'm feeling sad. I'm feeling unhappy. I'm feeling upset. I'm feeling concerned. Things that really just describe us. So look at all the work that we're doing to make sure to take any criticism and blame out. And um, I also wanted to make one more point about making requests. Again, I'm, I'm kind of going back to a previous point, but one point about making requests is if we are, if we're making a request and we say, hey, will you please take the trash out? And they say no. And then they would, and then we say, um, yes, you will take the trash out. Okay. Or if we, if they say no, and then we go and we pout and we sulk or we criticize or we punish them in some way, then they would be right to say that we're being manipulative, right? This is why we can't really use requests if we really want to get something done. Um, so, so can you see how if we make a request and then after the fact reveal, oh, that actually wasn't a request, I'm actually requiring you to do it? This is why I'm saying don't use requests because that could be seen as manipulative. That's why we'd want to just, instead of making a request, say, this is important to me, and part of being in a relationship with me means that I'm expecting this from you. That direct, that clear, direct communication is, is possibly more likely to be effective. So I hope that all makes sense. I'm sure you have a lot of questions, and you think, well, well what, what about in my situation? Um, what should I do? So, you know, um, reach out to me. Again, you can find me on Facebook. I'm Daniel Robertson. So it's facebook.com slash Daniel William Robertson. Uh, I'm on Instagram at Daniel Robertson Online. I'm on TikTok as Daniel Robertson Online. I'm on YouTube as youtube.com slash Daniel Robertson Online. Um, and yeah, you can reach out to me. So there's a lot of different ways to reach me. And uh, I'd be happy to help you with, you know, kind of follow up questions that you have. Uh, you, if you have your own experience uh, about how to communicate with the dismissive avoidant partner uh, that differs from what I've shared, I would love to hear it. And above all, you know, I just wanted to put I was thinking about putting this information in a paid course or something like that. Um, obviously, I would do some work to really make sure that this is, you know, structured in a way that you can really digest it in that context. But, um, you know, I just wanted to put this information out there. I'm hoping that it really helps you with your relationship. It helps validate what you're experiencing with your dismissive avoidant partner and helps you actually find ways to communicate more effectively with them. Because again, a lot of the standard relationship advice, the standard communication advice does not work. And uh, if you found this helpful, please do let me know. Uh, you've, you're really getting um, a lot of, a lot of hours of experience that I'm just, just giving you here. So I really do hope that it helps and, um, you know how to reach me again, the host of the dealing with an avoidant partner, free private pa Facebook group, that's a supportive community and the courageous love community, which is a paid membership, uh, program to find the love within to achieve lasting happiness and to achieve the feeling of security in a relationship or out of a relationship. If that's something that you want, you can have it. You can have it. Don't listen to the people who say you can't have it. You totally can. And I would be happy to talk with you about that. So I believe in you. I appreciate you. I appreciate all the work that you're putting in. I know that you love and want to be loved. And that means you've got a good heart. And I really, I really um, just appreciate that so much and hope you found this video helpful. Have a great day.